Hey everybody, welcome and thanks so much for coming today for the uh, official Australian launch of Cobas. Um, should I stand or sit down? It feels weird for me standing, you guys see. But if, you, if you'd rather I stand, just let me know while I'm, while I'm talking and I'll change my position. Um, so uh, my name is Andrew Levins, I'm a DJ and a writer and I'll be your host for this afternoon as we launch Cobas. Uh, before we start, I just would like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land that we meet on today, the uh, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. This always has and always will be Aboriginal land. I'd like to pay my respects to uh, all um, custodians of the land, uh, future, past and present. Um, so what I would love to tell everyone about today is Cobus. We are launching it um, today in Australia. Um, it is, uh, for someone like me, a DJ who has been yelled at by um, sound people on stages all across Australia for playing very low quality MP3s um, for decades now. It's really exciting <laughs> to me to not only have a uh, place where I can always be able to download um, high fidelity music, but also a place where I could stream it. This is the, the first way you can stream uh, hi-fi quality sound uh, through a streaming service in Australia. Um, so there are three kind of big things that we want you to take away um, today about Cobars, and that is that, yes, Cobars is the best way to get the best sound quality when it comes to streaming. Um, it offers its users studio quality sound, which reflects a genuine commitment to respecting what's created by the artists and captured by the engineers. Um, you also have a fantastic amount of editorial content. Um, I feel like so many different streaming services now are all about playlists and it, you know, you just, you subscribe to a playlist and you're constantly just being drip fed songs that that certain streaming service wants you to listen to. Um, Cobuzz is all about focusing on the albums, um, but they do so in a really unique way, offering rich editorial content including thousands of album reviews, biographies, articles on music news, test beds on new hi-fi equipment, interviews, files on the history of a group, a label, or a musical movement. And finally, we have a human approach to curation. Uh, it goes back to what I was saying about that kind of, you know, sometimes feeling like a robot is deciding your music taste for you. Um, at Cobuzz, a team of real life music experts who cherry pick um, interesting new releases or re-releases and highlight these on Cobuzz home page every single week. This team of experts is committed to highlighting genres and artists that may be underrepresented on other music streaming platforms. So we're talking about not the like most buzzworthy genres um, that you know people half our age are listening to every day. Uh, we're talking about you know uh, having a focus on not only like pop and rock but also classical, jazz, and other genres of music that don't get much look in on the other streaming services. And again, a, a very human approach to curation. And speaking of those humans. Unfortunately, the Cobuzz team couldn't be here today, but luckily we have apparently an extremely cute video that they've put together uh, <laughs> so you can get to know them. So uh, without further ado, please meet the Cobuzz team. See if you can guess which country they're from. Hello Australia, bonjour. My name is Georges Fournet and I am the deputy CEO of Cobuzz. We are coming to you today from Paris, France. We are so sorry that we can't be there with you in person due to obvious circumstances. We hope you are all keeping safe and well. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be the first to try Cobas in Australia. We are incredibly excited to be bringing this platform down under as we know how passionate Aussies are about music. Founded in 2007, Cobas is a pioneered high resolution music streaming and download service that meets the needs of demanding music lovers and audiophiles. With a catalog of more than 70 million titles, we offer the richest choice of high resolution references on the market. What sets Cobas apart is our absolute passion and respect for music, our determination to offer users exceptional sound quality, which reflects a genuine commitment to respecting the themes, the dynamics, and the message created by the artist and captured by the engineers. The Cobas foundations are deeply rooted in music production. Cobas was founded in France by music producers and friends who wanted to offer a high quality streaming service targeted at proper music lovers who wanted to hear their music the way it was recorded. In those days, music was sold by record, expressly and in a fragile format. Then came the area of legal and illegal downloading, shortly followed by streaming, which consequently resulted in a decline in quality. While this led to the democratization of music for so many, it also resulted in a proliferation of poorly compressed files and the degradation of sound quality, which fundamentally altered the listening experience. It is for this reason that Cobus was born, to offer an unparalleled high-quality music listening experience 
all while advocating for and respecting the artists and right holders. Before I hand you back to your host, I will first hand over to my colleagues, Axel and Mark, who will talk a little bit more about the technical aspects of our offering, our incredible catalog of music, and our commitments to artists and right holders. Hi, everyone. I'm Axel Destagnol, and I am the head of product at CoBuzz. I've worked in the music industry for a few years, and I'm proud to be part of CoBuzz because I believe it has a very unique approach to music streaming. It's not just about providing music. It's about providing quality, quality in sound and quality in our added editorial content. As George mentioned, Cobas offers our subscribers access to over 70 million tracks, and our mission is to give music lovers the best possible experience. Cobas gives you access to the highest quality available on the market, with FLAC 24 bits and up to 192 kilohertz. It's the original sound quality, as it was in the studio when artists recorded their music. Cobas is also a remarkable source of discovery and knowledge. Having a full catalog is important, but quality is also in the way we highlight the music through extensive metadata, biographies, reviews, and articles about genres, labels, and great artist careers. We provide the story behind the music, helping you explore and learn as you listen. Our catalog is available for both streaming and downloads. Our studio premiere plan gives you unlimited access to streaming, and we also have a high-tier subscription offer, Studio Sublime, allowing users to stream but also download music in studio quality with exclusive discounts. Welcome on board. We hope you'll enjoy the experience. Hello everyone, my name is Mark Zisman and I'm the Editor-in-Chief at Covers. I was a music journalist for more than 15 years and I thought that it was really more than interesting to bring my knowledge and my passion into a digital music service. My job is to curate and write features for covers. Editorial content is really a secret weapon and I think really sets up a path. Tens of thousands of album reviews and biographies, articles on musical news, test beds on new hi-fi equipment, interviews, features on the history of a band, a label, or a musical movement, Covers tell you the history of the music of yesterday, today, and even tomorrow. Whether you are a fan of classic rock, baroque, electro pop, death metal, jazz, deep house, or folk, we monitor all styles at Covers. To give you an example, I really enjoyed writing a full article on the making of, of What's Going On, Marvin Gaye's masterpiece. And I also like telling you the stories of iconic labels like Impulse or Stax, giving you tons of anecdotes. And with our video interviews, I had a chance to talk music with the likes of Nora Jones and a band like Parcel. This editorial content is a real wealth of information, but also a source of knowledge and even discovery. Music at Covers is really different for three reasons. On quality, editorial content, and human curation. These are really three values of which we are very proud. The sound quality, Axel told you about it. All you have to do is to test it to appreciate the difference with other music services, and those become addicted to this unique sound in the world. Discovery is essential at Covers and is always linked to the recommendations of our music experts. Because yes, Covers is also a team of music experts, a team that polishes unique playlists, also in all genres, a team of enthusiasts who show you every week artists to follow and albums that other music services may not have thought of. There you have it. If you're a music fan, if you're a true music lover, Covers will quickly become your new best friend. Well, that's it from us. I will now hand back to our host who will talk about the magic and the art of music production. We hope today's session will reaffirm or reignite a passion for high quality audio and give you a sense of what Covers is all about. Enjoy, and we hope to see you down under in the not too distant future. Au revoir. Thanks to the Cobuzz team for putting that together. Um, that red and black void that they filmed themselves in front of is actually a feature of the Cobuzz head office in Paris. Um, so, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, my name's Levins. I'm a, I'm a mere DJ who uh, could spout out the uh, many buzzwords that um, we're going to hear a lot of today, but um, that wouldn't be very helpful for everyone. So to help me uh, decipher what is so important about high, high quality uh, sound and, 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 and high quality sound through a streaming service, I have a special guest uh, joining me to discuss this with me today. Uh, I have um, Harvey O'Sullivan, who is the resident mastering engineer at Studios 301, where we are today. Um, Harvey O'Sullivan is a resident mastering engineer here at Studios 301 with over a decade of experience in his craft. He's worked here at 301 since 2013, alongside running FBI Radio's live music show, The Live Feed. Harvey is described as an extremely meticulous engineer who always considers the artistic integrity of the tracks presented to him. 
Harvey's mastering credits include works with artists such as Owl Eyes, Gordy, The Living End, Code of Conduct, Code of Conduct um, and Panama, to name a few. In addition to a number of live recordings and mixings from Vivid, Sydney Festival and Sydney's Biennale with artists such as James Blake and Sharon Von Etten. Uh, Harvey has since gone on to share his expertise with emerging talent, having lectured in sound and stagecraft at the Academy of Music and Performing Arts. Please welcome Harvey. So today, Harvey and I are going to be having a discussion all about the importance of audio quality when it comes to the listening experience. And specifically, we'll be, shine, we'll be respecting the music, or well, we're trying to respect the music, the way the art artist intends for it to be heard. It's all about shining a light on the behind the scenes work that goes into capturing the artist's intention, the small details that you may not consciously know are there, but are so intrinsic to the anatomy of, of a particular track or album. Uh, I got a couple questions uh, that uh, Harvey and I have kind of, we've, we've meticulously put together the perfect conversation basically uh, about music for you guys to uh, enjoy. And we will be uh, offering you guys the chance to ask Harvey uh, any questions you have about hi-fi sound uh, at the end of our discussion as well. So uh, get, make, sure, get, make, sure, make sure you have a drink and something to eat and uh, enjoy the discussion. Um, Harvey, to kick things off, for those in the room who don't know, can you please tell us exactly what a mastering engineer does? And then can you tell us what music would sound like without you? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I guess mastering is like the last port of call for a song. Um, you would have recording first, mixing second, mastering last. Um, so by the time it reaches you, it's already in a pretty good state. Um, it's already been mixed down into like basically the song. I guess probably the easiest way to put it is that, um, uh, you know, when a movie has like a kind of, uh, a color grade to it, I guess mastering is a bit like that. You put on the last sheen, you kind of polish it up, you reach a certain level in terms of volume and dynamics and tone. Um, you're also trying to make it translate to other sound systems. So when you, when you get an album, you might have one song that's really quiet, one song that's really loud, one song that's really dark and bright. So you're kind of massaging all the tracks together so that when you hit play on the front of the album to the end, it's like a coherent experience. You don't have to reach for your volume knob, turn it up and down. I guess, and what was the second part? The second part was, uh, what do you think music would sound like without you? Without the um, involvement of a, of a mastering engineer? Well, like I say, a bit up and down, I suppose, and a bit quieter, yeah. I, I, it would also sound a bit flat, like you have everything as loud as each other, as opposed to... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I suppose so. I suppose the idea is that you want to get a coherent experience through the, through the thing, nice and loud, present through the speakers. Um, and yeah, kind of consistent between speakers too. So when you listen on headphones versus um, in your car, it doesn't sound wildly different. Sure. Um, because um, you might have issues with bass and treble where they blow out on certain speakers. So you're trying to control those kinds of things. Yeah. Awesome. So we're going to be going through Harvey's process of how he masters and engineers. Um, the various things that he's worked on in the past. But before we get to that, I want to know, Harvey, how do you become a mastering engineer and what led you to this profession? Um, well, I guess I got into audio broadly kind of through my dad. He was a, a voiceover artist. Mm -hmm. um, so as a kid, he was kind of dragging me around to studios and, you know, he'd be off in the booth and I'd just be sitting in the back kind of observing. And it was like, I was really young. So it was like, Always a weird space to enter. You were like, I can make this sound better, Dad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can do better than him. No, um, I'd just be sitting there and I'd just be kind of like in this like zone and it was like a weird space to be in because you don't, like studios have that kind of vibe where the lights are low and the, you know, like the sound is really dead and it's got like a kind of chambery type feel to it. So it always kind of attracted me from a young age. And then I just got into playing with bands and stuff and I was like the guy in the band who... I was the only guy who kind of knew how to, to turn the knobs. Like if the sound guy didn't turn up to a gig, I'd be the one, oh, okay, I'll give it a go and mm -hmm. kind of muddled my way through there. Um, and then I kind of got into engineering and mastering just kind of attracted me. It was like the, the purest way to engage with sound. Um, I guess I did a bit of studio engineering and I still do a lot of live stuff and that's all very logistical. It's like the band's gonna turn up 
here and we need this amount of mics and we need these cables and we got to plug this into that and we got to there's a lot of man management and you know i mean you know yeah um it's just so much logistical stuff it felt like 90 percent logistics and 10 percent actually dealing with sound um whereas mastering you just come in and the song's already at a point all that has been taken care of um you just pull up the song on your speakers and that's kind of it. It's just, just you and the music. There's no yeah, people to ruin it. It's the <laughs> less, yeah, I suppose so, yeah. Um, it's just the easiest way to engage with music. And like, it's it's a very, ah, it's, it's hard to explain like um, how detailed you are with the sound. You're like really engaging on a deep level. Um, so that's kind of how I got into it. Yeah. Yeah, um, awesome. Um, could you please give us a bit of an overview? I mentioned the buzzwords earlier, mm. an explanation um, of uh, differences in sound quality, how sound quality varies between different formats and why. Well, um, I suppose the, the two main things you've got to worry about these days are like lossy versus lossless. And I think... Do you want, does everyone want an explanation of the difference between lossy and lossless? Yes, please. Um, so... He has, he has some very, very good analogies. Well, uh, <laughs> um, I guess... Lossy codecs are like your MP3s, your AC3s. When you listen to stuff through YouTube, stuff like that, um, it's what's what we call a, a lossy codec. So um, you have like, yeah, so MP3s were kind of invented to get the bandwidth down, get the file size down to a certain level. And, the, and an MP3 is about one tenth, one twelfth the size of like a full size web file. Um, which, so you imagine if you have to get something that's this big down to that big, you're throwing out quite a lot of information, really. Um, so, the way they do that is to kind of throw out information that your ears don't hear. So, your hearing is designed to hear at the most detail between that 300 hertz to 3 kilohertz. Because that's where the, the bulk of human hearing um, focuses on. And the reason why that is, is because like the human voice sits in that register mm -hmm. and we're designed to like focus on that. So if, you, if you're talking through a phone, you know how phones don't sound like, they sound pretty crummy, mm. like phone quality. That's because they just focus on 300 hertz to 3 kilohertz. Everything else is like deleted basically. Sure. Um, so MP3 is put a lot of information in that region and they kind of skimp on information in the lows and the highs. Um, so when you listen to an MP3, you're kind of missing a lot of detail in the treble and the bass. And that's because the codec is basically saying, we're gonna put a lot of bits in 300 hertz to three kilohertz. We're gonna put less bits below that, less bits above that. Um, it also works in like a stereo way where it'll put a lot of information in the middle of a in the middle of the thing where they throw out a lot of the stereo information as well. It's what we call mid side encoding, where like uh, how do I explain it? Um, a lot of people think of stereo as like a left speaker and a right speaker, but engineers might see it as like the middle mm -hmm. and the side. Sure. So you have that what's in the middle, down the middle of the mix and towards the side. So your, your hearing doesn't hear very well that side information. So it'll throw less bits in there as well. Um, so that's what a lossy codec is. It's, it, it's, it's shrinking a, a 50 megabyte file that was a WAV, like yeah. a three minute song in WAV down to like, you know, a, a th five three, or six meg, yeah, yeah. Five, five megabyte MP3. And the reason we call it lossy is because once you've, bring it down to that you can't build it back up like if you like if you take an mp3 and convert it to a wav it'll have lost information it's like a lossy process about when about 20 years ago maybe a little less than 18 years ago a lot of djs thought that's how you made a song sound better yeah, you would reconvert a really really low quality mp3 back to wav and the, the belief was that oh that's how you make it sound better in the club mm, no, no. <laughs> um but then again, a lossless codec, and I think they mentioned it there, FLAC, that's mm -hmm. what Cobuzz used. Um, that's what we call a lossless codec, where it, it does shrink the file down a bit. It gets it about half the size. Um,
but then when you rebuild it to a web, it's lost, it hasn't lost anything. Um, it's a bit like a zip file where um, if you have a zip file, you zip it up and then you unzip it, the file is exactly the same. So if you zipped up like a, a document you typed out, you don't want to lose half the words. It, it comes out bit for bit perfect, but it's, yeah. it's shrunk it down. Exactly, all the space around the words because it's been deleted. But the yeah, yeah, it, it actually, well, it looks for patterns and then kind of applies an algorithm to kind of, yeah, yeah. shrink it, I guess. Sure. But yeah, it's like a pattern recognition thing. So funnily enough, you can actually get a WAV file down to like very little if it's like a sine wave, if it's just a repeating pattern, um, the codec can actually go, I recognize that pattern and I recognize it repeats. So you could get a 50 meg WAV file of just a sine wave down to like a few kilobytes really. Right. Um, so the more complex the material is, the generally the larger the file will be when it compresses down. Sure. Um, so let's go through the different, um, uh, like, uh, uh, like how different formats, how, how they sound and why. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess like your streaming services generally work on like an MP3 or MP3 like thing. I don't mm -hmm. think they all exclusive the mp3 but yeah. there's a lot of things like that the itunes store i know if you download an mp3 is it's about 256 kilobytes yeah yeah so that's the bit rate yep um that's the amount of bits it will assign to each second is where is it bit. black do you know off the top of your head um uh, well it's not so much a bit rate because it's uh it's like a lossless codec so it kind of operates on a different system um yeah, I don't think they give it a bit rate. I think it's like a variable thing. Sweet. Again, back to that complexity. If like a section is very complex, it'll just have to naturally give it more bits. Where if it's like less complex, then obviously they can shrink it more. And yeah, so it's, I guess, a variable bit rate. Yeah, so what we're talking about, I guess, is your Spotify's, Apple Music's, uh, more popular streaming services are operating off of an MP3 equivalent when it comes to streaming, whereas Cobuzz is operating off FLAC, which is significantly more high quality and uh, closer to the studio experience when it comes to sound. Well, I mean, it is really because it's lossless. It hasn't mm -hmm. lost anything. It's, yep. it's the same thing, really. Yeah. Cool. Does it, what do you want, like, half an hour more technical talk? Because <laughs> <laughs> we could do it. <laughs> I think we get the idea. It's like lossy versus lossless, yep. and that is quite a distinct... Yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll go back to the mastering process. Can you talk us through your process and throughout that process, how do you ensure that the artist's intention, the artist's intention is captured? Uh, yeah, that, that's a kind of hard question to answer really. Um, in terms of technically what I do, it's, it's a lot of listening. It's like probably 80% listening and 20% actually fiddling with knobs. And we're going to go into Harvey's studio or a version, something quite similar to Harvey's studio. It's not exactly right? mine, but yes, yeah, so it's, it's a room like what I've got. Yeah. And it's, you know, you, you, you've described it as the best what played a place to listen to music. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can't beat a, a room that's, well, that's what it's built for really. Um, yeah. But, but because not everyone is, has access to a studio like Harvey's, in fact, an extremely small minority of people would. Mm. You actually, it's not just in your studio that you're able, that you listen, that your mastering process and your listening process, you know, you have to listen to uh, things that people will actually probably most likely listen to albums on these days. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I mentioned it before, translation is what, it, what we call it. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that, yeah, of course, that room with speakers, it costs more than a car or a house <laughs> deposit. <laughs> Um, of course, they're going to sound amazing, um, but yeah, I like well, we call it translation because I want to get music that sounds amazing on those speakers, but also sounds amazing on your AirPod, iPod things and um, your car speakers and out of your phone and out of your laptop. So yeah, I mean, yes, we listen on amazing speakers in amazingly tuned rooms, but we also listen on um, well, everything, anything I can get my hands on, I'll listen to what something I've mastered on that. I mean, the actual technical process of mastering is not super complex. It's like your basic, you got your EQs, you got your compressors, you got your limiters. Um, and we both basically listen for tone and dynamics. So trying to balance the, the, the tone, the bass versus the treble and that kind of thing, uh, which we adjust with EQ and bring the dynamics into... Uh, 
So say if you have like a really quiet part of a song and then it goes into a super loud part of a song, balancing that so that you can keep the artist's intention of, yes, this bit is quiet, yes, this bit is loud, but you're not actually losing, you know, it doesn't actually sound really quiet in the quiet parts. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, like no, you're sure. kinda, it's still audible. Yeah. It's not as shocking when it, when it suddenly becomes loud. Yeah, or like what's common is you'll have like, the first half of the song is quite quiet and then the chorus really kicks. Mm -hmm. But when someone hits play on that song, they don't want it to start off really quiet versus another song they've listened to. So you have to kind of, it's a bit of a balancing act to make the quiet part loud, but still appear quiet versus other parts of the songs, uh, other part of the song, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, totally. So it can be a bit of a jigsaw puzzle trying to turn it up, but not turn it up too much or maybe you roll a bit of treble off at the start and so that it sounds not loud, but it is loud, if that kind of makes sense. There's a few little tricks like that. Sure, and what are some of the considerations you need to make when mastering for different formats? Um, there's really only two formats you really have to consider and that's like digital versus vinyl mm -hmm. uh, because all the digital formats I mean, they don't really differ too much. Um, like, you don't put it this way: I don't master for a lossy codec uh, versus a lossless codec, as we mentioned before. That, yeah, you just don't really think about it that much because they they don't really, yeah, that doesn't come into consideration. Where vinyl, there are limitations of the format where you can't have as much bass, so you have to. Well, that's why like a lot of records from the 70s, they sound a bit thin. They don't mm -hmm. have as much, like bass these days is huge mm. versus like the 70s where it's very thin just because they couldn't put, physically put bass onto a vinyl. No one had turntables in their car. There was no <laughs> yeah, like space like that. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to show if you're sick subwoofer. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the way like vinyl is like a needle being dragged along a bit of plastic. Mm. And it's got like a channel like that that it travels down if you have too much bass on it the, the channel kind of thins up a bit so that the needle actually pops out I didn't know, that's awesome. yeah so there's actually a few physical things like that so vinyl is when you actually have to might do a, a whole second of a master but um yeah i mean you don't really have to consider different formats like oh this is going to youtube so i have to master for that yeah sure they kind of take care of that kind of thing in there but, but the less that's done to your mastering job to put it on a streaming service, the better it will sound. Yeah, I mean, obviously I like yeah. stuff to be listened to in lossless formats mm -hmm. just because that's the way I'm hearing it and obviously that sounds the best, yeah. Awesome. Um, can you talk us through some of the albums or tracks that you've mastered and is there a particular piece of work that really challenged you or a work that you're really proud of? Um, I, I guess the, the challenging tracks or the challenging albums I've worked on are ones where the, like sometimes you get a mix and it's just not good. Mm -hmm. And in a way that's not as challenging as when it's almost good. Um, so if I get something that's like a really, it's a bad mix, there's only so much you can do. And there's like a, I'll do the best I can to make this sound good, but you know, mm. can I go so far? But sometimes when it's like, can almost get it I can almost make it sound amazing but I can't quite that's when the, it's really challenging um, I wouldn't like to name names specifically but um, yeah, there's a few things where I'm just like you just put a lot of time in and you just can get it 98% and you can't quite get it to 100% um, yeah I think I think that's yeah that's the hardest ones sure and then something that you're really proud of um, it's mostly mostly like Australian artists, but my my most proud ones are probably like Australian artists where you kind of go, oh, what's this? I've never heard of this, and you know, it just comes up on the booking form. You're like, oh, what's that? And then you listen to it, like, wow, that's amazing, you know. So that, that's what I kind of like about the job. You kind of always discovering new music. Um, yeah, a Brisbane artist that always stuck in my mind is Caper. Um, I'd never heard of them, and. I just got like three tracks in by them and they were like a really amazing kind of electronic duo kind of dark unique kind of sound and yeah i just really like that so yeah i guess yeah that. you must get that like um 
a personal attachment to things that you connect with musically. Yeah, it is nice when you've worked on something, especially when it's like a kind of... Yeah, there's a few artists where like... Um, you kind of work with them over the years and the, like maybe when they first come in and you first see them, you're like, oh yeah, yeah. But then they kind of grow and you start seeing them get better and better. And there's a few artists like that where like, like a couple of years in, you're like, wow, they've actually really, really turned into something quite amazing here. And that, that is very satisfying. Yeah. Awesome. Now I imagine you're probably, it's very easier for you to talk about stuff that you didn't master yourself. Yeah. Um, uh, so could you talk us through some of your favorite works of all time? And in particular, uh, in your opinion, is there an example that you could think of a perfectly mastered track or album? What makes it so special? Um, well, I have, I have quite eclectic music tastes. Um, I'm really into like kind of sound designing music, like your boards of Canada, your burials. Um, and uh, I was really into My Bloody Valentine's kind of new album. Well, I say new because it's not super new. Uh, but that was a really interesting master job because um, it's, it's one of the few instances I've, I've kind of seen where mastering is used as a creative tool. Usually it's not, it's not super creative. It's just like we're going to make it sound loud and consistent and nice. It's more of a there are creative elements, of course, but it's a kind of a technical process. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like mixing where you add delays and you cut out sections and then you might focus the vocals or pull it. You know, that's a very creative process. Uh, but with the My Bloody Valentine album, they the first song is quite quiet. And it's actually like 6 dB, which is, is quite quiet. Um, that's like huge, um, like 6 dB down. And the album slowly gets louder as it goes along. So that by the end it's actually hitting zero uh, only at the last track so it's like someone's taken that album and they just slowly turning the volume up the whole way through um which you probably wouldn't even notice like if you if um, the only reason i noticed is because you you dropped it in and into like a software and i could see it getting louder oh, like, yeah like a yeah brack yeah which is really strange that's like a that's a very strange choice to do um but it actually makes sense because they're like a very loud band. They like sound huge and loud. Um, so the idea is that I guess they're kind of trying to trick people to like, when they first put on the song, it's it's quite quiet. So they like turn it up. And then by the end, it's like super loud. And it kind of mimics the way humans hear as well. Like if you're listening to music, your, your sensitivity will decrease over time. Uh, so that's one thing when, when you're mastering or working on any in audio is that you have to be aware that um, you will hear less throughout the day. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you're aware when you're DJing and like after an hour you're like, fuck, I'm not hearing this anymore. You know yeah, I mean? no, for sure. Especially if you, got the, if it's also you have the volume and the headphones turned up really loud. Or yeah, the yeah. It's really loud in the mix out, out in the yeah. crowd. Yeah. It just batters you after a while. Totally. You hear yeah. it. It's fatigue. fatigue. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's clear that you have pretty sensitive ears when it comes to, to music. Um, when it comes to listening to music, you must have um, a few pet peeves, or do you have pet peeves that like kind of frustrate you? Um, you know, what, what, what do you look at? What, what kind of things will annoy you when you're listening to a, a badly mastered music? Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm picky about sound quality, but I'm not super picky when I like a song. Mm -hmm. Like, um, at the end of the day, music's music and I love music, so I'm quite forgiving. Um, there are a few kind of things where it's like overly loud. Um, it was a bit of a trend maybe 10, 15 years ago. I'm sure we've kind of heard of the loudness wars um, where it was just how loud can I get it? And that was actually degrading sound quality to quite an extent where music was sounding clipped and distorted. Mm -hmm. And that is not pleasant. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not super picky, really. Um, yeah, I like to listen to good music in good rooms and stuff like that. But yeah, I, there's not anything huge that annoys me. Yeah, Yeah, I've grown up thinking that sound guys are the angriest people in the world, but I feel like mastering <laughs> guys are maybe like the, happy, like the most calm. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you just kind of hear it all. Like, sure. and um, part of the fun of working in engineering is like, you work on a classical piece and then the next day you work on a pop piece, you know, so 
you do kind of mellow in your attitudes towards music a bit. But I used to be like, I only like this kind of music. Sure. Like, especially when I was younger, I was really into like metal and like heavy music and like everything else was, uh, that's, that's, you know. But then like, um, you grow up and you're like, oh, well, I can actually see that this pop song actually is really amazingly produced or, yeah. So I remember thinking, you know, Party in the USA by Miley Cyrus. Great song. Well, yeah. <laughs> it, I remember thinking, man, this sounds like a million bucks. Like it just sounds amazing. Like it's just so present and yeah. full and like they use the whole frequency range and yeah, like you start to appreciate these things a little more. And, yeah. It's very brave of you to admit. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not so much that I like have these pet peeves, but you start to appreciate things a little more. I kind of prefer to look at it that way. Yeah, suppose, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, with that in mind, what do you think is the absolute best way to listen to an album? Um, well, I mean, if you can in an amazing room with amazing speakers, yeah. I mean, wherever you feel comfortable, really. Um, I, I, I think lossless does make a, a pretty big difference. Um, I mean, listen through a lossy codec, it does... Uh, it, it takes a bit of the sparkle out of it, like, because to what I was saying, where you you lose that high end detail mm -hmm. and you, you do, if you put them side by side and you listen to them side by side, A, B them as it were, you do miss a lot of that high end information that like the ting of the symbol and that kind of thing. Sure, um, atmosphere. Yeah, and I, I think sometimes it's not always immediately noticeable, but it's a cumulative thing. You know, over time you do start if you listen to a lot of lossless music on good speakers over time, you do kind of go, yeah, I get it. Like sometimes it's not always like nine dog. It's like, you know, over time you're like, you kind of get your ear into those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, so obviously yeah, speakers, I guess like that, that's your ideal, especially you know, in a well-tuned room. Mm. But if we break it down even further, like, I mean, most people are probably listening on their phones, specifically through headphones. Yeah. Um, what do you look for in a quality pair of headphones? And and I guess what do you look for <laughs> um, in, in your home setup as well? Like what what are some what are some kind of products or like you know things which you're looking looking for on the labels of our products that we buy? Uh, yeah, good question. I I like flat um, headphones and speakers. So what I mean by that is some brands they like have hype bass or sure. Um, so I personally tend to look for the flattest frequency response um, just because going back to lossless audio where that's like a more you uh, an experience more like the studio where it's more their intention they want you to listen to it this way they're generally when we listen to speakers in the studio they're generally tuned flat so a good stereo, a good studio speaker, sorry, is generally very flat, not hyped at all. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a personal thing. Um, but then again, a good pair of hi-fi speakers that have a bit of hype bass, a bit of a nice sweet low mid, can be good too. Um, I do, I do like the, the Sony headphones. Um, those the wireless ones. I've got a pair of them, and they sound pretty amazing. Like the the especially the noise cancellation is very good on them yeah uh, so yeah I, I do like to put them on put an album on and kind of walk around at night being a bit of a weirdo um, <laughs> just listen to music um, yeah around the, the streets of sydney um uh, that that's a nice way to listen to music yeah For sure um so in the cobas video that we watched um with the uh, the guys from france kind of going through the evolution of streaming and kind of the various speed bumps that hit along the way like the, the, the dawn of, of MP3s and Napster and, and that and, and kind of every time a new service gets uh, introduced there's there's gains for, for but also losses mm. um, are you able to help me like we can do it together like kind of go through like what we think of each evolution in terms of sound quality sure or maybe we can even like I mean we can talk think about the history of streaming but are we coming to the point now where it is coming back around where we want it to sound as good as it was when it was you know physical format yeah i mean i think well mp3 mp3 and mp3 like codecs they solved the problem that was there at the time 
And in a way, it's quite a miraculous um, invention, MP3s, to get a huge file down that small and for it to sound still as good as it does is pretty amazing, yeah. really. Um, but we don't really have the same problems anymore because that was like a limitation of bandwidth, you know. I mean, they came around in the 90s when it was all dial-up. Yeah, it still took um, half an hour to download. Yeah, I'd, I'd... Three megabyte. Yeah, yeah. Night, night, uh, I'd be MP3. downloading files and just be like, come on, it's sort of <laughs> like an hour for one song. But still, you got it and you were like grateful. Um, but we don't really have that same problem anymore. Like the bandwidth is there to accommodate lossless. So mm -hmm. why not? Um, yeah. So I, I think it, it was solving a problem at the time, but we, that problem is not really there anymore. Um, so yeah, but I mean, there's been a lot of evolutions in the music industry, obviously. And, um, they have varying degrees of audio quality. Mm -hmm. um, like CD was pretty amazing. That was a huge leap forward. Um, unless you had like tape machines, but that was like prohibitively expensive. Um, yeah. So I think MP3s, they were great for what they were, but we're kind of evolving past that. Yeah, and we certainly have the means to listen to, like, you know, as everyone's phones get more complex and uh, mm. our network gets stronger and stronger, there's no reason why we shouldn't be listening to higher quality audio. Yeah, through them. sure. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Uh, we have one last question before we uh, I guess check out your digs. Um, and that is, uh, what do you think of the future? What do you, uh, we're kind of already covering it. But what do you think the future of music streaming is and what's next for how we consume music? Um, well, yeah. I mean, I hope that we kind of move to more lossless ways of listening to music because yeah like i said why not um i mean i think lossy codecs have their place and they will for quite some time especially with like your your video streaming services um i mean if you're already hitting up 4k video maybe adding on top of it lossless audio mm -hmm. might stretch uh, the ambient a little bit uh, but yeah i mean i think you know also I've been digging around in Cobars a bit and they have like a bit of a curated way of doing things where, uh, you know, they have articles and stuff and that, that's a nice way too, you like a nice way to discover music and mm. stuff like that. So I think, I think that could be, you know, that could be a way to, to look at it as well. Um, yeah. I like the way that it, it, rather than like just getting a playlist of music that kind of sounds the same, it's like, Hey, you listen to this album, maybe you'll also like this album. Yeah. Yeah. And just kind of learning more about it too, where um instead of just a song popping up and you don't know anything about it it's like reading about it i mean you know i kind of like that learning the about context. the context yeah yeah giving a bit of context to like genres movements stuff like that that's all that's all good stuff it's a good way to discuss like a lot of people people used to be just into like i'm the rap guy or i'm mm -hmm. the metal guy but nowadays with the internet i don't think you don't really see you don't really see goths walking around anymore. You know what I mean? People aren't into like, <laughs> a little bit of everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. People like kind of think, oh, I like this, but I also like that, and you know, so you don't get people who are just like the one thing anymore. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm uh, maybe I'm out of it. I think it's, it's easy. It's just easier to get into everything now. Yeah, yeah. You know, the information is there. You just have to Google it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it also helps to have someone to introduce it Absolutely. to as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Where do you start? Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I do hope lossless becomes more of a thing just because, you know, like I said, we have the, the capability to do it, so why not? People you know? start appreciating the work you do more too. Well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. It's, about the, it's about the music, really. Sure. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, totally. Um, um, well, those are, oh, that's all the questions that I have for Harvey today, but if anyone else has some questions for Harvey, um, you're welcome to ask him anything you want about mastering or, or life. Um, and uh, the two of us have, uh, have been, uh, while, while no one from Cobars is here today, uh, the two of us and uh, a few of the staff from Adhesive have been uh, fooling around with the app uh, for the last few weeks and we know it pretty well. So if anyone has any questions related to that, we can try our hardest to answer those questions. Uh, I'll start with you. So you, you hear people make claims about recrystallizing you know, compressed files or is that just all nonsense? Recrystallizing to, to try and return some of the frequencies that have been removed. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's kind of in the name, isn't it? It's like a lossy codec. You've lost it. Um, I, I think there are like, yeah, I, I, 
I mean, I'd have to listen to those kinds of things, but I, sure. I doubt that's possible. I mean, on, on uh, te televisions, you know, 4K and 8K TV say that they'll upscale yeah. uh, lower content and they'll sharpen it. And, you know, there's some improvement, but it's not as good as the real thing. Yeah. So I guess it's the same for music. If they pretend they can do that, that you might sound a bit better, but again, it's not the same as... Yeah, I mean, I haven't looked into those kinds of things because it seems a bit snake oily. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's why I'm asking. Yeah. I'm asking the master. Yeah. Um, I'd be interested to hear it and just to like hear the technology involved. Well, one thing's for sure, there's no loss to ask you. Yeah, that's fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, given all of the focus on having music as intended and as recorded originally, if you were to be tasked with remastering an older track which was originally confined to the limitations of vinyl, how would you go about striking a balance between preserving that audio fidelity but also with all the tools you have now? creating a fuller sound. Uh, you would drag a sample of a crackling record over the top yeah. of the track. <laughs> Voila. Um, that would be difficult because when I've thought about things like remasters I've heard, I generally don't like them because I remember the song a certain way. Mm. So I'm thinking about like, I remember hearing the Smiths box set and they sounded huge and I don't remember the Smiths sounding huge and like with lots of bass and stuff and it just sounded wrong to me. <laughs> yeah. um, so if, if someone said, here's a record from the 70s, remaster it for today, I'd be like, do you want it to sound like today or mm. do you... So it'd be a discussion with the artist and their management, etc, etc. Um, I mean, you can make it... If, if it's there, you can make it sound full and you can make it sound modern and huge and big. Um, it's just wherever you want to and wherever you're kind of destroying a memory mm. of what people have of that record, I suppose. And it's, it's a little bit like the Beatles remixed their albums and not even remastered, they actually remixed their albums and they sound quite different. And when I listen to them now, I'm like, cause I grew up listening to a lot of Beatles. So those songs are like deep in there mm. and even just like hearing like a guitar slightly louder than it used to be it was like no nah, it's all wrong i don't like it yeah <laughs> so yeah it's, it's the ukulele in something that gets me every time the, yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah the background instruments yeah mm. you got any other questions what about those super expensive headphones you know they're from sony and others that they're thousands of dollars compared mm. to you know just the bose or the sony ones or even airpods i mean do mm. you, how much extra sound do you really get is it really worth thousands of dollars more um, whoa. uh, <laughs> that'd be up to you, whether you, you know, it's hovering over the buy them. button. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I've, I've been to some Sony events and heard mm. the, these super expensive headphones that cost 20 grand or something, and they yeah. do sound incredible. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I haven't listened to the 20 grand ones. I mean, I think I've topped that at maybe three or four grand. I mean, I don't know. I'm do just pulling that price out of the air. Yeah. They do yeah. sound amazing. Um, the way I look at kind of headphones is I generally use headphones as like a commuting thing, like if I'm on the train or going somewhere. So that's why I like noise cancelling ones and they sound good, but, but they don't have to sound amazing. Sure, but at home you've got some fancy speakers and stuff. Yeah, I've got good speakers. And that's why I'm kind of like, if I'm at home and I'm going to spend money, I'm going to spend them on speakers because I don't really want to be, you know, <laughs> trapped in. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they sound amazing, you know, like more money, more R&D, more yeah, components. I mean, we talked about the fatigue that, that, that I experience sometimes if I'm wearing my DJ headphones for a six hour gig, you know, my ears are going to hurt. Whereas those expensive um, headphones will often eliminate that by being more comfortable overall or like, you know, not being able, not being as punchy in terms of uh, sound. So you will be able to wear them for longer. So why don't you use them? Uh, because they're not made for DJing, they probably destroy them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you, they don't belong in a backpack. Yeah. You're going from club to club, you don't really want to have to worry about $20,000. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. Still, it's your ears, you know, maybe they're worth it. <laughs> Regarding the, um, the curation and the background information and the journalism that comes with Cubase, who's providing that? For the Australian launch, I, the reason yeah. I ask is because I mean, the French think Jerry Lewis is a genius. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is their opinion uh, of uh, the arts necessarily? 
uh, look, I was really interested in that myself as well. We did meet um, uh, the the writer who is in charge, and she's actually she has a background in classical music. Her name is uh, Jessica Porter. Yeah, Jessica Porter Langton, um, and she is a violinist. Um, she has a long lot of background in, in classical music in Australia. She currently lives in London, but um, you know only recently moved there, um, and she's like the first person to be working on editorial for Australia. I imagine they're going to be growing it pretty soon. Um, but Where do I apply? Yeah. <laughs> He's serious. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I can tell that. Can tell. <laughs> you just uh, yeah, send, send a letter to the, the red and black void. <laughs> I, I wasn't serious about Jerry Lewis crap. <laughs> <laughs> Have we got any other questions? Um, yeah, just in regards to streaming... You know, with the MP3 or MP3 like file as compared to a lossless file, what kind of difference in data are we going to see? What impact is that going to have? Um, so I think MP3s are, if you're streaming at like 320 MP3, mm. I'd say that's about a six of the file. So that's like your, your typical song is about like. 12 meg, something like that. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's around about two megabytes per minute. Yeah, and then a, a FLAC file, if it's a 4416, um, that's about half, so you're probably looking at like 24 meg okay. a song kind of thing. And if you're streaming in high res, which uh, Copuzz does, um, up you, to 192. You do have the option to listen in not high <laughs> fidelity, so yeah. if, if you're yeah. worried about data. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, you can switch it. Um, Cobuzz also does like high res audio as well, which is goes up to 192, and those files are quite big. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't know the exact numbers. I mean, no, that's overzoomed. Yeah. But you can download it and listen offline, though. Exactly. Yeah, you don't have to yeah. stream yeah. all the time. But that would be quite darn intensive. Yeah. 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 About the same as streaming a movie, really. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, what are we doing next? Are we, are we, are we having a little walk or? <laughs> Awesome. Before we all get up, please uh, make uh, everyone uh, acknowledge how good Harvey was. Thanks so much for coming today. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.